turn him over to a bank and he showed and he said, I said to him, how many people do you think will come out on a Monday night? And he said, well, it's going to be just basically my friends. And I know he was lying because he has not got this <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm going to be talking for a bit first, and we're going to have a ten minute break, and then we get the full proper show. So I'm sort of like the fish course, you know. Uh, <laughs> the tradition is when you invite, when you do your own show, you get to choose who your support comedian is, and you don't want anyone too good. So I really, really, you know, really appreciated Ben asking me. <laughs> so it's a Monday night, and you lot are out. Don't you have jobs? Some of you drinking. Is that allowed even in Sweden? <laughs> drinking on a Monday night? I, seriously, I, I can't work out your rules as to when you're allowed to drink and when you're not. Because, you know, when I'm drinking on a Monday morning outside Sustainable, people just give me the, the evils, you know. But I, lo I, love, I love the system below over here, what a great system. Uh, a shop that is designed to just sell alcohol and every single poster in the place just says how bad alcohol is for you. <laughs> it's like uh, Klaus Olsen having just posters saying that most of this stuff is shit, don't worry. <laughs> and yet, it's the, have, any of you, have you any of you old enough to remember the old school system below here? Where, not when you went around yeah. a proper shop, yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When you and it was always, when, I always went on a Friday afternoon, like just before it closed, and there's like queues and queues of people, and I always got the old woman who had no memory, and you just go, <laughs> I'd like a, and then I'd, I'd never know what I wanted. I go like a, a, a bottle of red, um, and she'd say, so and I like, I don't know what work here. You tell me, and I go. I don't know, I've had one and there was a picture of a tree on it. Is that not? <laughs> and she'd go, uh, yeah, I think I know the one you mean, except in Swedish. Uh, and then she'd go off and she's like walking like this. And then she'd come back and they'd put it all in a tray and then she'd bring it back and it would be like white wine, you know, sweet white wine. I'm going, that'll do. <laughs> But pe people are a bit funny about alcohol in general, you know, we've all become a bit too healthy for my liking. Uh, I'll give you an example, my, my granddad, he drank a bottle of whiskey every day, he's from Scotland, we do that sort of thing. Um, he drank a bottle of whiskey every day, smoked 60 cigarettes a day, and he died peacefully in his sleep surrounded by his family. Now, I mean, that, if that's not an, a good example, I don't know what, I mean he was 25, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then, I, and then uh, when, we, when it came to Sweden, I've got, uh, anyone else got children? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I always tell you, know, they're like little people, they live in your house. It's completely ba a baby, yeah. And then they grow into big ones, and then they just sort of hang around your house and get on your nerves. I've got three children. I found out the other day that each child, between the ages of zero and 18, they cost you 1.4 million crowns. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, they don't tell you that, do they? <laughs> it's too late now. There's no aperture. I can't get that money back. <laughs> That's nearly four million for me. What a terrible investment. <laughs> They're absolutely awful. I mean, I, I wasn't a fantastic child, I'll, I'll admit it. Um, but I grew up in the, in the 70s, uh, and I mean, our parents had it so easy. They really didn't have to do anything. They would just bung you out of the house, like kick you literally out of the house. You'd, you'd go around, try not to get killed, and then come home. And <laughs> And it, because we didn't, there was no reason for us to be in the house. We didn't have anything good in our house. I mean, the presents we had at Christmas were fucking pathetic. I mean, really. Did, did you have the slinkies? <laughs> a spiral of metal that you put at the top of the stairs and you make it, yeah. You just, you kind of, you're too no go. That's it. I mean, come on, does that count as a present? No. My mate got one and he lived in a bungalow. He was just like, oh, thanks. <laughs> I remember, because I, I, everyone had them, so I thought I might as well get one. So I, I, I described to my dad what it was. I said, spiral of metal, you know, bloody blah, blah. And I was given the uh, shock absorber from a Ford Fiesta 1980. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't great. Uh, but then we also had the, uh, the Rubik's Cube. 
How fun was that? I couldn't even do it. I mean, how useless a present is a Rubik's Cube to someone who doesn't know how to do a Rubik's Cube? I was not intending to learn, either. A um, little bit of trivia. My, my uncle worked in the Rubik's Cube factory. Uh, he, he worked at the end of the production line, because when they made them, they made them all jumbled up. And it was his job to solve them all at the end of the production line. So he, and, then he, going, and then someone said, why don't we make them solved? And he was out of a job. I mean, <laughs> Really, anyway. uh, but, uh, yeah, and then, you know, uh, now I live in Sweden, it's great, came here for the weather mainly. Uh, I mean, people go on about the British weather, but come on, Swedish weather, it's pretty shit. Uh, but, you know, Sweden has its positives, but, you know, when you come over here and you try and integrate, you don't make it that easy, especially with the language. I mean, your language is... I mean, hardly anyone speaks it, for a start. Uh, only you lot. Uh, I mean, you, you don't get people sort of in Mexico going, I think I might learn Swedish. That'll come in handy when I'm travelling. Uh, but you, what you do is you, you seem to run out of words, so you reuse them. I mean, I know you're into recycling and all that, but that's taking it a little bit too far. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, you have a word, var, right? Which means election. It means choice. I'm with you on that. Yeah. And it means whale. <laughs> <laughs> what meeting did that come up in? Yeah, I think we reused whale. Yeah. I was confused as hell. We, we, we got the, the, the menu from my kids' school, and, and on the Thursdays it said, Shirk, it's a vol. <laughs> so I looked at it. I said to my wife, no, it's kitchen whale. Um, that's definitely what it means. Um, very, very confusing. Uh, uh, yeah, and then I, I read a, a, a headline on the newspaper and it said, Reinfeldt's to faster vol. And I thought, how many whales does he have? <laughs> One of them is to, considered to be his toughest. <laughs> this is my last dust, this is my toughest. <laughs> and then what you, you like to do is, because you never help us out as well, you have words that look the same, but you pronounce them slightly differently. So, and the one that I really, really struggle with is cot. Caught and caught, which leads to some fairly interesting situations. Uh, and and I, I had a girlfriend, and I described, I was going to say she was a caught hoary shay, and I said she was a caught hoary shay. She's not my girlfriend anymore. Um, and then we, we have an expression in, in, in English where you say, I'm a bit short, which means I don't have enough money. So I was at a shop, and I'd just got, come to Sweden, and I was desperately trying to use the language as much as possible. And I, I was a couple of crowns short, so I turned to the woman next to me in the queue and said, Yelp, you're a little court. And the Yelp man. Said, Yelp. You're a little court. Can do Yelp a man. You're a penga. And you're a little court. So I'm banned from 7 Eleven. Uh, my, wife's, my wife's a nurse over here. Big shout out for the nurses. Whee! Job. She's also English, uh, and she got called by a bloke who uh, phoned and said, I've got a utslog, like a rash, on, on my pungen. Okay. <laughs> Which is apparently something you call about. I would I'd pick that quite quiet, I think. So he turns up, and uh, my, my wife was quite new there, so she, she always wanted to like make sure someone else was there with her to, to help with the, you know. Uh, whatever you call it, diagnosis, and um, this lad came into the room and she said, okay then, uh, if you'd like to just take off your trousers and your pants, and then I'll come back in with my colleague, and he just sort of looked at her and went, okay, 
So she went out, got her colleague, came back, and he's sat there without his trousers on. And then they both just are like looking at his crotch. And they both went, but that looks all right. And he's going, okay. And they said, but I don't see any rash. I don't see a hootslog. And he said, the hootslog put me tongue now. Borderline sexual assault. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely awful. I love those delayed laughs. Uh, so now we're, we're heading towards winter, which is like, because I'm British, you know, favourite time of the year, it means winter sports. Nothing, do we, we excel at nothing better than winter sports. It's the first thing you think of, isn't it, when you think of winter, winter sports? The British, yeah. <laughs> you see this in the Winter Olympics. We just go for the things that require absolutely no skill whatsoever. <laughs> Anything of this, you know, sliding around properly on, on sticks, we can't do that. But the ones where you nearly die, sledging, basically. <laughs> you see? Yeah, skeleton. Yeah, skeleton. We had the luge first, which was like sliding down on a fucking tray, feet first. And then someone went, I'll tell you what, we can do this head first. This would be, <laughs> this would be so much better if we do it head first. And of course, everyone in Britain went, yes, I can do that. So getting into the British Winter Olympic team is really, really tough. It's basically, if you own a tray or skis, you're in. Uh, you get a free tracksuit and everything, it's brilliant. But I, I, I do think it's a little bit uh, harsh that there's only a Winter Olympics and a Summer Olympics, because those are two seasons that we don't actually have in Britain. <laughs> I'm thinking it would be fairer with sort of like an autumn Olympics where you know, I don't know, avoiding puddles or <laughs> running in to get your washing off the line when it starts raining, that sort of thing. But I saw, I saw a wonderful video uh, a couple of years back actually, it's a, it was a Russian high jumper and he got absolutely hammered before some, it wasn't the Olympics but it was before some event big event and he, they filmed him trying to take his trousers off and it was fucking hilarious. <laughs> I mean he, he'd had, I think he'd had a bottle of vodka, obviously in Russian, uh, probably his breakfast. Um, he'd had a bottle of vodka and then, but I noticed this video had like four and a half million views and then you look up other high jumpers, for example Stefan Holm, you know, twitchy. Uh, seven views, all of which, all of which are his mother. Um, and I think, you know, I think this is what people want. People don't want like normal high jumping, they want drunk high jumping. And I think it could be sort of like across the whole board. I think, I don't really like the Olympics, but I think if everyone was hammered, I think I'd start to watch it. Uh, I mean, imagine sitting in the audience or the crowd, and there's yeah, like the javelin, and you know they've just, they've just downed a bottle of gin. That makes it a lot. I mean, normally it's just someone throwing a javelin, but with that sort of added element, it's excellent. Uh, but I, I have a I have a habit of uh, making a bit of a fool of myself, uh, not just on stage, uh, in general in my life, and. Uh, uh, what, I was, uh, a few weeks ago I was on a, a flight back from Malta and I fell asleep. Uh, now normally falling asleep on a plane is not that embarrassing unless you're a, an open mouth snorer. Uh, I always love that when people fall asleep on the train down to work in the morning and they go <laughs> and, then, and then you see them wake up and they do that <laughs> <laughs> and everyone is looking at them and they're just going <laughs> Anyway I fell asleep on the plane but I, the problem was, I woke up and my face was completely in the groin <laughs> of the man next to me. <laughs> Which is fairly embarrassing, but he was wearing light trousers and I had left the biggest pile of room I've ever seen. It was huge. It looked like he'd wet himself, basically. And then, and then I looked and I was sort of like, oh, sorry. And then as I was sort of bringing myself up, I noticed it, was, it wasn't just down there. I'd started up here. <laughs> so I'd fallen asleep on his shoulder and then slowly fall, made my way down and then ended up drooling in his... Now he was Swedish, of course. So <laughs> he just sort of went, oh, you know. <laughs> 
Did I say anything? Uh, much better not to say anything. Oh, I'm just sort of an, another another thing with the language that you you lot are so proud of. What word do we not have in English? Logo. That's it. Logo. You're so proud of that word. It's the most Swedish word there is. Logo. <laughs> I mean, we do have a word for logum in English, and that is meh. I mean, no one, no one wants logum. We want too much, or, well, we want too much, basically. But you do actually have a word over here that we don't have in English, and that is ola. Uh, now, for those who don't speak Swedish, and this is true, uh, it means touching something with the end of your penis. <laughs> Quite a specific word, really. And also, I mean, words don't just happen. You've got to, you've got to do things quite a lot before you need a word for it. So for many, many years, men in Sweden were walking around touching things with the ends of their fingers, and then they said, "Yeah, I think we're going to get a word for this." What do you think, Ola? What? I grew up in uh, yeah, the 70s, it was a much more innocent time. I, I remember uh, when, we, when we used to do gym, uh, if you forgot your gym kit, they made you do it in your pants and your vest. I mean, how we, they wouldn't be allowed to do that now, would they? That's just, that's just humiliation. And basically, British schools are based on humiliation and, and, and fear. Fear and humiliation. Uh, we're very well behaved uh, because uh, I, I remember once I was in with the, the uh, headmaster and he was talking to me and a huge fucking wasp landed on the table next to him. And he's talking to me, telling me what an idiot I was, etc, etc. I was used to it. Uh, and then suddenly he just went BAM! like that. And kept his hand there as well. And he was, he was uh, looking at me while he did it. I mean, what a fucking amazing thing to do. I was just so scared. But I mean, this, this whole sort of uh, fear we have of of, of the unknown. When, I mean, when we used to go home from school, we used to go in, uh, there was a nice old gentleman at the end of our street called Mr. Jenkins. We'd go in, he had a, a computer, don't know why. Uh, <laughs> but we, uh, you, we used to play, his, you know, he'd give us biscuits and stuff like that. You just wouldn't be allowed to do that now, would you? Everyone would be like, oh, he must be a paedophile. Everyone's so suspicious of everything. I mean, it turns out in the end he was a paedophile. <laughs> With, you know, which explains him having a computer. Um, it, nothing gets kids around. The computer we had, did everyone, anyone else have the Atari 2600? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. For those that don't know, it had wood along the side. <laughs> nothing screams high technology like wood, does it? <laughs> they were there designing it. How are we going to make this look super model? Well, we've got this wood, we could use that. Yeah, go on then. Whack it on the side. But the great thing was, I mean, we, we had 14-inch televisions, if we were lucky. Probably in America they had 180-inch screens. But in, in, like, Victorian Britain that I grew up in, it was a 14-inch screen. And back then, a pixel was about four inches across. <laughs> so it was basically just six flashing lights. Uh, and you'd see these, like, the covers of the, the games, and you'd be like, oh, tank attack, blah, blah, blah. And then you'd get it, and you'd be, <laughs> I mean, luckily, we, there was a lot of drugs back then, so uh, it was still completely fantastic. Uh, that was another way they kept us quiet as well. If you, if, you, if you went to the doctors with your kid and they were like, this, my kid doesn't talk enough, we'll give him this. And it was uh, all these medicines that were either meant to make you go faster, slower, <laughs> stop, shut up, whatever. <laughs> Great. I may really miss those days, but it does mean I have no memory whatsoever of anything. <laughs> and another thing as well, uh, one of the favourite puddings back then was the trifle, the, the great British trifle, which is basically sponges soaked in alcohol, and then jelly on the top, and then custard, of course, because it's England, uh, and then cream on the top. And basically, I mean, they'd have like one and a half litres of alcohol in it. So everyone would go, and go, oh, I'm driving, I'll just have like half a kilo of that. And all the kids were running around, our kid, the kids were just going mental, you know. But also at that time, everyone wore nylon clothes. So the biggest, everyone was scared of like nuclear war and that, but the biggest risk 
in, in fact was just spontaneous combustion at parties. <laughs> Warm spark from a pair of nylon flares next to a trifon. <laughs> You're gone. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just end with a, a, a quick story of uh, one more humiliating episode in my life. Uh, I, was, um, I was on the Tunnel Banan. Um, <laughs> Again, strange double use of the word. So I was on the Tunnel Banan, and uh, I live in Kniska, and we don't get to go on Tunnel Banans very often, so we get quite excited. Well, I do, anyway. So as soon as they call out my stop, I, I jump up. And I've worked out, have you noticed that uh, drivers in, in Tunnel Banans, they stop randomly, you, you know, in the middle of tunnels. No, no, I mean, there can't be traffic down there. <laughs> but they'll just slam on the brakes. And I think they have a, a video camera inside the carriage, and they wait until you're not holding on properly. And then, they just... <laughs> and then I think they, like, they gather all the CCTV, and then they hit, like, and, uh, and the driver's parties at the end of the day. So, <laughs> so anyway, I was on the Tunnel Banan, and I, they called out my stop, so I jumped up, and of course the driver was like, Yes. <laughs> Slammed on the brakes. I fell forward, and there was a bloke reading the metro opposite me, and I fell straight through his paper. I mean, sliced it in half. And he was Swedish, so guess what his reaction was? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> if you've ever seen anyone try and keep two sides of a paper together, <laughs> it was amazing. All right, that's all from me. Um, <laughs> we'll